Yes. Cool. Okay. I do am you doing this also. Want the light on? Uh, yeah, on and. How does the light look? Oh, uh, it's not plugged in. Plug it on. And then I can keep all of this in the background. What's in the background? What's in the shop? Do I need to move out of my way? Is the light necessary, or what do you think? I think a it little bit of light. Camera. A little bit of light? Yeah. Okay. And uh, where are you going to sit? I'm going to sit over there. Okay. It could also work if you were doing like an interviewer style, so then your voice is always loud. Are you just going to keep recording? You know and what not I'm saying? Stopping? Yeah. So, yes, yeah. yeah, I think you should keep sitting there. Uh, okay, because the audio will be essential, and if you're all the way over there, you'll be harder to or hear. Or sit there f until we go into a scissor. Well, no, like, even, like, because he's the one reading the poetry, I think he needs to be the most audible. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it makes sense. All right. Um, okay. Um... Are we ready? Mm-hmm.
also I feel like half of the reason why I'm doing this is to freak mom out. Because she thought that I was going to go with the uh, with the long hair route, and then I just switched it again. <laughs>
you say that now is a good time? I think so. Okay. So, uh... Uh, to introduce the video, um, first off, uh, Anand and I are both getting our hair cut by our brother Ashish, and we thought it might be fun to also shoot this video at the same time, so that there is some, you know, passive entertainment that you, you guys get to have as well. Um, also, uh, I like this idea just because it's like, similar to the idea of the of the French salon uh, and then we're also in a literal salon so I thought that was kind of cool um, and also to give a brief overview of what we're gonna be doing um, we are going to be reading a an alternate version of Dante's Inferno that uses contemporary examples and um, people in order to illustrate the same like core uh concepts and ideas from uh the original yeah so we're going to be reading uh the mary joe bang uh translation of inferno and this is what the book looks like so We'll just, uh, jump right in. Mm -hmm. Canto 1. Stopped mid-motion in the middle of what we call our life, I looked up and saw no sky, only a dense cage of leaf, tree, and twig. I was lost. It's difficult to describe a forest, savage, arduous, extreme in its extremity. I think and the facts come back, then the fear comes back. Death, I believe, can only be slightly more bitter. I can't address the good I found there until I describe in detail what else I saw. I don't know for certain how I entered it. I was so sleepy-faced at the place where I took a wrong path. When the wooded valley had just passed through in heart-rending terror, Dead ended at the foot of a hill, I looked up and saw the sun bright on the body of the hill's high spot, like a headlight that helps the lost find the way. The turbulent fear that had filled my heart during the night I had passed in such sadness calmed some when I saw it. Like someone breathless after an escape from the deep end, who stands at the side of the pool and looks back on the danger and list of close calls. That's how I looked back. My mind a stop top in the middle of a turn for a glimpse of where I'd been, a place no one leaves alive. Yeah. So do we want to discuss that part? Yeah. Um. Immediately, uh, you can kind of recognize that, uh, the ideas that are being, asserted are being done so in an almost, like, conversational manner. Right. Um, yeah, it seems to be a, a kind of like an anecdotal, um, uh, I think it literally translates as like legible as opposed to the, uh, right. Mandelbaum translation, which is like yeah. more, uh, interesting in the way how you can break it down. Right. Um, this, I think, breaks it down in a very clear way. Yeah. It also kind of uses the, uh, like a more contemporary, uh, form, um, that helps to kind of convey the, uh, the sentiments that, uh, Dante uses through, like, sheer poetry. They're doing, they're basically telling rather than showing. Mm -hmm. Um, which I guess, you know, I think that in some ways it has a, a, uh, an effectiveness in how much more direct it is in in conveying the idea. Um, 
And for that, I appreciate it. Um, I am curious to see how they change the cast of characters and also how they deal with the metaphor. Um, because it does seem to have, it feels like there is a, like a metaphorical, um, you know, they, they are, they do feel like they can speak in a more metaphorical way, but the, I don't know. Well, uh, the delivery of the metaphor seems to be almost more conceptual rather than sensual. Do you see what I mean? It's evoking like a kind of like a um I don't know. Well, um to bring attention to one deviation from uh the poem and using a more contemporary metaphor uh was the uh pool. Uh Remember the, the pool? Like someone breathless after an escape from the deep end who stands at the side of the pool and looks back on the danger and list of close calls. That's how I look back. Right, right. And uh, I think that uh, it is definitely creative to... Uh, substitute the uh the shore with a pool mm -hmm. um because it just makes it sound more realistic to our uh sort of yeah it's something a bit more relatable yeah understandable but the thing is i think it actually loses an essential part of its uh, original metaphor which is that um, the person is a is like a survivor. Right. They're the the lost at sea that seems to uh, it takes on a more like um, uh, the journey is like much more uh, grand. Right. Right. And also like there seems to be this sense of like when you're at sea that um there is a a kind of unknown like about where your fate you know is like what your fate is like will you find land or will you just re like because i think that's you you st struck upon where the metaphor kind of uh doesn't align which is that when you're at sea there is this kind of crushing weight of you know how bleak and um, consistent your external reality is, or what you are perceiving as your external reality, where there is just kind of waves that go on endlessly in every direction. There is a hopelessness that cannot be like conveyed through the metaphor of the pool. The pool, in some ways, almost it 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 almost like uh, it makes the the issue trivial mm -hmm. and like you even get into the vagueness of uh <clears throat> like what that danger was uh with the description of and looks back on the danger and list of close calls like the danger and list of close calls is such a vague description you know yeah and like i don't think that I think that you have to explain uh what could possibly be um commensurate in magnitude right uh to like the close call of like surviving a shipwreck yeah and a close call like drowning in a pool mm -hmm. like I I see the similarities but I don't think that uh yeah it yeah and I think that's what I was trying to get at when I say that they're addressing it in a more conceptual way rather than like having the depth of the of the metaphor in Andelbaum's in Mandelbaum's uh version which has a kind of uh sensory um substantiation 
Mm -hmm. of the metaphor. Yeah. I, uh, I really like the, uh, I really like the first, um, I guess you could call it Tercet. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, because, um, if you look at the book, um, there are three line stanzas. <clears throat> uh which goes stopped mid-motion in the middle of what we call our life. I looked up and saw no sky, only a dense cage of leaf, tree, and twig. I was lost. Like, that is uh, essentially the same uh, introduction as uh, a any other translation, but it's like, definitely capturing a more uh fantastical um representation of uh you know the metaphor sorry uh i was only half paying attention could you say that again it wasn't really um an observation that's like worth reiterating okay yeah um so should we move on then yeah i rested for a while and then started up the sandy slope i lifted one well-intended foot while the lower one acted like a post Suddenly, at the base of a rise, just where the hill begins, its steep incline, I saw a leopard with a patterned coat, light on its feet, and lightning fast. Wherever I looked, it was there, blocking the path, so that several times I turned back and began to retrace my steps. It was daybreak, the sun rising with the stars that were with it when the first clock started. The spring wound by the hand of a love supreme who set in motion those beautiful things. That's like a, that's pretty cool. I like that. Which part? Um, the, the line about, um, the clock, uh, being like, a metaphor for a, um, a love supreme, uh, who sets in motion beautiful things. So, like, you have the line, it was daybreak, the sun rising with the stars that were with it when the first clock started. The On spring- the first what? When the first clock started. Oh, um, see. The spring wound by the hand of a supreme, of a love supreme. So, like, I mean, it's literally being, like, uh, you know, acted upon by a greater force. Right. You know, in some ways, this translation, actually, I understand it more than the one from the original. Yeah. To me, it almost gives uh, time a sort of... Uh, an anthropomorphic uh, yeah. aspect to it where like time is in and of itself like a an act of love um, and that uh, the movement of the clock is meant to symbolize the passage of, of time right In spite of the beast with his snowy coat, I felt hope, reassured by the fact of morning and the hint of spring, although the promise hollowed when I caught sight of nothing less than a lion. He seemed dead set against me, head high, crazed with hunger. 
It made not just me, but even the air around him tremble. And after him, a she-wolf, her frame so emaciated, her body seemed defined by the cravings that had caused so many to live in misery. Looking at her bitch kitty face, I felt an odd sense of solid defeat and lost sight of any hope of climbing higher. You've seen the one at a roulette wheel who whispers sweet nothings to his wings, but when he loses, whimpers, how did we come to this, and wrings his hands. I was a sad sack like that, as impossible, as the impossible beast inch by inch drove me back into the shadows, where the sun keeps a stopper in its mouth. <laughs> That's I, cool. I really like that. Yeah. That was, uh, that gave it a completely different uh, feel to it. Dude, it's almost like as though the sun is characterized as, like, alcohol, like wine, you know? Yeah, it kind of, uh... It's like it, this... It gives you a sense of euphoria that, like, may or may not be, um, useful to your survival. Or, or it's like a, it's like a euphoria that is, um, not sustainable. Well, I was thinking of it as something valuable that is meant to be preserved. You know, the stopper is like that, uh, that action of preserving the wine, you know? Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I think in this case... Well, no, I mean, I'm working off of that same imagery because wine inebriates you in the same way. So it gives you a, a, a kind of, like, a, a, you know, a, 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 what's the word? It's a uh, a fleeting sense of euphoria, I guess. There's a better word, but um, like it's not it's not a forever, you know. It's it's noting the nature of addiction and how it's something that um. Is not. It's. Dude, you know there's a word, right? There's a there's a very specific word that I'm trying to find. Do you know what I'm saying? That is similar to inebriated. No, no, that's similar to uh, fleeting. Oh. Uh, it's um. uh, it's it's like a. It's a moment that. Transient. That, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. It's a moment that, exactly, it's kind of, it's not a, a universal truth. I mean, it is a universal truth, but it's not something that um, is permanent. Mm. Sorry, I don't know why I felt the need to, like, um, find that word. No, it's fine. I just really felt like I needed to uh, finish that thought. What do you think about the... Uh... What do you think about the... Uh gambler um metaphor uh i think that that um it's just a a different um kind of you know i mean it's it's kind of like building on the metaphor of uh of addiction kind of mm. or you know like it's kind of it's it's uh it's adding more to the sense that this individual is is living life in a in a kind of transitory state. Hmm. Is that the word? No, that's not it. No, that's not the word. It's not transitory. I would say transient. Trans transient again. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah. That's yeah. Sorry, I uh, I mixed it up. Uh, but I meant tran uh, transient. Okay, so shall we continue? Uh, yeah. Just gonna do this for a minute. Um, okay. Oh yeah, I uh, I want to mention that I actually misread um, the description of the leopard. Uh, in spite of the beast with his showy coat, I felt hope reassured. It was, when I said it before, I said snowy coat. And at the time I was like, that's a really cool description of the leopard. Like, mm. it's like adding in another element to it. Right. Um, but in fact, it was not. It was... Yeah. But the fact that it, they called it a showy coat makes me even more certain that it has to be uh, representing of the category of incontinence sins. Mm-hmm. Because, like, incontinence is basically, like, um, a lack of impulse control. Um, right. Like... It's like a lack of... Um, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's incontinence. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Yeah, they're describing the, the idea of incontinence. Yeah. Wait, so how did incontinence relate to the coat being showy? Oh, because, like, um... There is a kind of hedonistic imagery it's like um the showiness indicates that like the concerns of the leopard are about its own image i see so it like has like this almost uh like yeah like a mm -hmm. like a self-absorbed nature right Okay. And, like, being self-absorbed is kind of, like, incontinence. Yeah. Because you're, like, not able to rein in your, uh... Yeah. Your ego. Or, like, your, uh... Your impulses. Okay, um, I will continue reading. Wait, I mean, yeah, go for it. I think the audio should be fine. Yeah. Um, I was rushing backward into ruin when I saw someone who, given I'd been alone for so long, seemed almost like a mirage. There, on the wasteland, I called out, Take pity on me, please, whatever you are, ghost or material man. I was once a man, he said, but now I'm not. 
both my parents, both Lombardi, were born in Mantua. I was born late in the day of Julius Caesar and lived in Rome under the reign of Vid Augustus, back when the gods were false and told sweet talking lies. I was a poet. I sang the song of the righteous son of Anthesis, who came back by boat from Troy after smug Ilium had been burned to black ash. But you, why return to what made you unhappy? Why not climb the meringue pie mountain ahead of you? It is the ultimate end and means of all pleasure. I said, you're Virgil, aren't you? You are the rain, you're that rainmaker who creates a torrent of speech that turns into a riptide. Then I felt bashful and hung my head. The best and brightest in the class of poets. I read you and loved you and hoped that what I learned from you will now serve me well. First of all, authors and masters of me, I borrowed from you and to you. I owe a debt for the music that's brought me success. Can you see the beast I had to flee? Can you save me from her? You, Mr. Ubermensch, you, Mr. Man of the world, I'm shaking with fear. Dude, that dialogue is like so funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Man of the World. <laughs> Man. Um, could you read the early part of that again? Uh, do you want me to read, uh... Yeah, just like, from the very start. Yeah, sure. Um, I was once a man, he said, but now I'm not. Both my parents, both Lombardi, were born in Mantua. I was born- Wait, wait, I was once a man? What? He, he says I was once a man? No, um, he said I once, I was once a man. But now I'm not. Both my parents, both Lombardi, were born in Mantua. Okay. Um. What do you think about the metaphor of him learning about his poetry in school? Do you think that that uh, corresponds to what the original um, passage was trying to... to to say yeah I would say so um cause remember in Mandelbaum's he's like you that fountain of uh right but, but I was wondering if like the con like the the context of school that setting is uh you know accurate mm. is that kind of what their relationship is like the thing is that there's actually not really uh any mention of a school the closest thing is the mention of a class of poets um okay so you're right dante does have peers um but I don't think that a school is expressly uh, described. Oh, okay, yeah. I heard class of poets, and it, and I and I heard I remember reading about you in the past tense, mm -hmm. which kind of gives the sense that it was a mandatory, um, like. reading assignment. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting association. Like, I don't know if that's what they were trying to convey. No, I don't think they were. <laughs> um, but it would be uh, cool if it was like that, you know? Yeah. If they tried to characterize Dante as like a, a student in a... Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, that's all I was wondering about. In a modern academic setting. Um, did you notice anything else interesting from that part? Um, yeah, I, uh... I I like the uh, description of the meringue pie mountain yeah. ahead of you, um, which like I think is a uh, a great description because it's like something that literally makes you like your mouth water. Like, it's, like, what you desire. Right. And so, like, in order to conquer the mountain, you need to conquer your desire. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because he says, like, at the top of the mountain is, like, all, you know, what what's the word? He, like, uses, like, he makes it sound like it's, uh, um, filled with, like, many, like, sensory pleasures. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there seems to be a kind of contradiction, no? Because incontinence is like the, uh, the indulgence of pleasure. Right? And you're saying that, th um, this is an example of what? No, I'm saying that the, uh, it's, I guess it's, I suppose it's an irony that the, the, uh, the trial that he must overcome, uh, and, and the prize is essentially um, what he actually desires, right? Like, incontinence is kind of you striving to uh, obtain true happiness and, like, ob well, obtain, like... I think uh, something that you're forgetting is that the mountain represents all three beasts. It's not just the leopard. No, uh, I'm not saying that, but can you just read the passage about what's at the top of the meringue pie? Yeah. Mountain? Um, but you, why return to what made you unhappy? Why not climb the meringue pie mountain ahead of you? It's the ultimate end and means of all pleasure. Right, so that right there is literally what I said. It's the, it's the, uh, the, you know, it's the end, it's the, um, did he see, say it's the means to the end, or it's the end to the means? No, it is the ultimate end, and means of all pleasure. Exactly, so he's saying exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. The end is the but, means. Um. To all pleasure, and so, ironically enough, the overindulgence of pleasure is what does not allow him to have true happiness, and I can say that for certain because he says in the earlier line, why are you down there where you are unhappy? By inverse, that means at the top of the mountain you would be happy. So, true happiness is at the top of the mountain. So, um... I think that's something. I can't hear you. So, uh, what I should mention is that when Dante says means of all pleasure, it's kind of like a debate, because the, uh, ultimate pleasure to Dante is, like, achieving a state of, like... Enlightenment? Yeah, like, and, uh, exactly, like, enlightenment in your religion. Right. 
Um, yeah, no, I assumed. I assumed as much. I just was mostly pl- taking a look at the specific word that was used, which is pleasure. And so, I, so like, a part of me is aware that it is not simply just that relationship to pleasure, but I think that pleasure, nonetheless, is an interesting word to use in describing that. It is. That sense of enlightenment. Because it, it does kind of, you know, inextricably connect the two, enlightenment and pleasure. Yeah. It kind of is a very Nietzsche, Nietzschean kind of... Uh, idea right yeah and I mean um, I think that line the means of all pleasure is uh, and I mentioned this in our Mandelbaum episode um, that is like the indicator that you know that the mountain is a representative of purgatorio um, because uh at the top of Purgatorio is like the earthly heaven and that begins like your process of um, achieving like the ultimate pleasure which is basically getting closer and closer to God (laughs) so like um, as you go up through heaven which is basically categorized by like the planets um, that like are in our solar system right um and like it's funny because like as you like elevate through the planets and it's funny because they're literally like like levitating and just like floating up into the air yeah um that's how they're like traveling um but like as they go up um everything becomes brighter and uh your vision uh, is able to see that brightness. It doesn't become blind. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, that's so, a really uh, so that's crazy like the metaphor. pleasure. That's the pleasure that Dante's talking about. Right, but that's a really cool metaphor, I think, because in a way, that is what enlightenment is. Is it's like you are able to see the bigger picture, but you are able to kind of witness it without balking at the prospect of what it is. Mm -hmm. You're able to kind of um, have a a mastery over your own self-conscious body and mind. Mm -hmm. That you can kind of reach that elevated state. Elevated status. Yeah. So, uh, to continue on, um, when he saw that I was now in tears, he said, in that case, you have to take a different route to escape this place that is not, that is only rock and the sandy road. The beast that drove you back and made you cry ends the life of any who try to pass her on their way through. She's insane and insatiable. She eats more, and that just makes her more malignant with craving. She kills all she comes in contact with, all with whom she comes. She takes many to her bed, and many more are coming until the day the big dog arrives and deals her an agonizing death. The dog doesn't need property or money, but lives on knowledge, love, and truth. He'll be born between two layers of felt. He'll be the savior of the now humbled country for which the gallant Camilla and three loyal boys died of their wounds. He'll search for her in this city and that, chasing the bitch back to the hole where Envy first undid her chain and choked her and set her loose. As we go forward from here, 
It's best if you stay behind me. I'll play the part of your guide. It's my plan to lead you through a place never ending, i.e. eternal hell, where you'll hear the worst kind of wailing, see the ageless shades writhing in pain, sense their vain requests for a second death. I gotta drink some water. Yo, could we actually uh, pause it? Mm. Yeah, we should go over.